Good afternoon uh, to everyone. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. My name is Stephen Crutus. I'm a, a radio presenter with the South African Broadcasting Corporation, and I've been asked just to host uh, today's proceedings, just to sort of manage things. It's a Zoom call, so we all know it's unmanageable anyway. I'd like to say good afternoon, if only because I think all of us are in time zones where it is already the afternoon. For some, it's just past lunchtime. I apologize. We'll be done in an hour and a half or so. Um, let me tell you what we're talking about today. You'll be very aware of what looks still, at we, as we speak right now, the possible imminent annexation of a part of the West Bank by the Israeli government. We know what the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has said. From what I can see, it hasn't started yet. We're not exactly clear as to why it has not, but this is a big, important and urgent issue, which of course raises up all sorts of questions that go back, in some cases, many years in history in that region. We have a great panel to discuss this today to tease out some of the issues. Um, you'll know that Jack Munayar is the local program coordinator of the Ecumenicable Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel for the World Council of Churches. Uh, Reverend Father Jamal Kader is a parish priest in Ramallah and director of the Latin Patriarchate Schools in Palestine. Sharona Weiss, uh, Weiss excuse me, is the Director of International Relations at Dieshtin, an Israeli human rights organization. And uh, the Reverend Dr. Muntha Isaac is a parish priest at the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, Palestine, and the Academic Dean at Bethlehem Bible College. I will give each participant a few moments to express their view, but first, I'd like to invite our host, the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches, Bishop Mpumwana, just to make a few introductory remarks. So the uh, Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for uh, uh, helping uh, drive our program forward. And welcome to our panelists and to the guests that are in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the webinar. I want to just say a few things. First one is that uh, we are uh, passionately concerned about the peace of Israel and Palestine. We are passionately concerned about the peace of Jerusalem, and we would want to have have everyone focus on what it will take for that peace to be achieved, uh, because it is in the interest of all the Abrahamic faith, Jerusalem as a place of our spiritual, um, a, a, as, a, the, as the Pope has put it, is, is a kind of the, the common patrimony of the Abrahamic faiths. Um, and, and so every part of this conversation has to be about what it will take to make for peace so that everyone can live peaceably with security. I grew up uh, in a time when it was said, we used to have the phrases that say, let the white South Africans be driven into the ocean. Uh, there was a lot of that phrase. And, and of course, um, uh, it, it, is, it is an impossibility because uh, you cannot unwind history and say white South Africans are no longer Africans. And, and I think that we are caught up in the similar situation as far as Israel and Palestine is concerned. All of us do understand that, you know, uh, there was a promise given to Abraham, and all of us understand that there was, in fact, an instruction uh, to Saul to get rid of the Canaanites, uh, and everyone that was not, that was not a part of the house of Jacob. And this was supposed to be the order of the day. But the reality is that uh, we've got Palestinians uh, now who are full natives of, the, of that environment. And, and, and in fact, uh, many people, many of us don't even know that uh, there are Christians in Palestine, uh, which is very surprising because, <laughs> because uh, all of us are Christians because the people in the Holy Land first believed and, and they've remained as believers. And so what this is an opportunity for us to hear a little bit from those people that worship there Sunday after Sunday to give us a sense of what it is like for their environment and help us think about what we can, all can contribute to the peace. We must make sure that Israel is secure, Palestine is secure, and that should be the goal for all of us. And that's really what we're hoping the dialogue and the, the conversation will lead us to believe more of. Thank you, Stephen. Bishop, thank you very much indeed. All right, I'm going to invite our panelists to speak. We've uh, given them eight minutes as guidance. Um, I'll be as, as loose as I can with the guidance, or when you get to 10 minutes, I'll just be polite. Um, I'm going to ask Jack Munai, the local program coordinator of the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel for the World Council of Churches to start. Your uh, <clears throat> 10 minutes starts now. 
Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm here to present uh, two issues for us to understand today that we believe are obstacles to peace uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. The first is the issue of annexation, what it means and what the annexation plan is. And the second is a, a law that passed in the state of Israel two years ago, which will dramatically change the way we understand the conflict. Now, because we're talking about annexation, I'm going to have to use some maps. So I'm going to share my screen now. So for Palestinians, the whole story of annexation didn't begin just this year or last year. It's an issue that has followed us for almost a century. And it's a story about the loss of land. Throughout the years, we see that the territory for Palestinians to live and exist has slowly, slowly shrunk due to wars, due to different arrangements that have been made. And the annexation for us is another step in this process. And uh, from the year 1967, we see here that the West Bank and Gaza has the rest of Israel and has been occupied territory. And even further more so with the issue of the settlements, which we will discuss in a little bit. But when I refer to the issue of occupation or occupied territory, what does that mean? What is an occupation? Well, an occupation is the effective control by a certain ruling party over a territory, which is not under its formal sovereignty. And an occupation were normally set out to achieve a clear set of goals. So if we think of a recent occupation, when the US uh, invaded uh, Iraq uh, with a number of other countries, that uh, portion of land that the US invaded did not become part of the United States. It was under a military occupation. Um, the clear set of goals were allegedly to find weapons of mass destruction. So this is an example of an occupation. An annexation, however, is a formal act whereby, whereby a state proclaims its sovereignty over a territory that is outside its domain. So another way of describing it is an annexation. An annexation is an occupation gone wrong. Uh, an example of this is Morocco and Western Sahara. Uh, Morocco occupied Western Sahara and then annexed it into its territory, saying this territory is now part of Morocco, it's mine, and Morocco, Moroccan laws now apply there. So to sum it up, what are sort of some of the differences between an occupation and an, annex and an annexation? An occupation must be temporary. It cannot last for a large amount of time. It must be short, whereas an annexation is permanent. An occupation, generally speaking, is a legal tool that states can use to achieve purposes, where an annexation is almost always illegal. An, an occupation is administrated by a military, where an annexation is, is administrated by the state. Uh, an occupation aims to protect the laws of the occupied. In other words, it cannot change the laws of the people being occupied, and it cannot violate their human rights. An annexation puts new laws on the occupied completely. An occupation cannot change the status of the land that it is occupying. So when the US invaded Iraq, using this example, it could not change the fact that that is Iraqi land, whereas an annexation fundamentally changes the status of the land. So Western Sahara became Morocco. So when we're talking about occupation and annexation, these are some of the main differences that we can see when it comes to this issue. However, are the Palestinian territories then occupied? Well, technically they are. There are 25 Security Council resolutions that say that this territory is occupied, and the International Court of Justice has given the opinion that all of the West Bank territory is occupied. However, we face a slightly different reality. Uh, in the laws of occupation, you cannot take people out of their territory, nor can you put people from your state inside that territory which brings up what we believe to be perhaps the biggest obstacle to peace, which are the Israeli settlements. All across Palestinian territory, there are a number of Israeli settlements that are inside that territory against international law. These types of settlements are access only to Israeli Jews where Palestinians have to stay away from them. The impact this has on the community could be anything from uh, natural resources, water, and more specifically roads. This is an example of a settler road, which you see on the left-hand side of the wall. And then on the right-hand side of the wall, you see a Palestinian road. 
This is the type of separation and segregation that we see in the occupied territories as a result of settlement. Well then, why am I raising this? I'm raising this because you cannot really call this situation an occupation. Although technically it's an occupation, the reality is that it isn't temporary. It's gone, now, it's gone on since 1967 for over 50 years. The territory itself is dotted, as you can see on this map here, all these blue and purple circles are Israeli settlements in Palestinian territory. And so that's against the laws of occupation. But it isn't exactly an annexation either, because Israeli law hasn't applied directly across all of the West Bank. So Palestinians are stuck between two situations, between an occupation and an annexation. But let's talk a little bit about the annexation plan. So if you can follow my mouse here with the map, all this area, which is light brown, is the Palestinian areas. All the blue area is Israeli controlled area. And this dark blue area here on the right hand side is the territory that is part of the new annexation plan. If this annexation plan moves forward, it will take around a third of the West Bank territory and will most likely stop any possibility of a Palestinian state being formed in the future. Furthermore, a number of the settlement blocks, which are in the dark blue dots that you can see all across the West Bank, further restrict this option. Jericho, the old city of Jericho, will become an island in the middle of annexed territory. And there are 50,000 Palestinians that live in the Jordan Valley that are likely to lose their homes, are likely to lose their rights. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about what happens next. So perhaps another way to understand this is to look at other historical examples. This map is very fragmented and is divided based on people's racial, ethnic, and religious backgrounds. So we as Palestinians look towards the history and more specifically the history of South Africa to understand how these things have come to be the way that they are. Here we see a similar type of islands of territory which don't really make sense and don't really work. And so unfortunately our expectation is that we will be living in a similar situation to what we see in this map over here. So this is generally speaking the annexation plan. To take this territory over here and incorporate it into Israel proper which leaves Palestinians with very little. Now, a second issue that I'd like to cover very quickly is a, is a legal issue that affects Palestinians like me. I'm a Palestinian, but I live inside Israel. And so does 20% of Israel's population also identify more or less as Palestinian. So 20% of the population in Israel are of Palestinian background. And they face discrimination by the state and the Jewish majority on a regular basis. Just to give you one quick example, 2% of the coronavirus aid budget was given to Palestinian cities, whereas 98% was given to Israeli Jewish cities. And this type of discrimination and segregation of people is enhanced by a very specific law. This is the new nation state law that passed two years ago. Here are three things that it says which make it very problematic for a Palestinian like myself to live and in peace with my Israeli Jewish neighbor. The first point is that it holds that the state of Israel is the national home of the Jewish people. It completely ignores and excludes anyone who is not Jewish, which is over 20% of the population. The state views the development of Jewish settlement as a national value. So here again, we are seeing the privilege of one group of people to settle and expand its territory on the expense of the other. And perhaps the most important point, the third point, is that the right to realize self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people, which means I, as a Palestinian Christian living in Israel, do not have the right of self-determination under this new Israeli law, which is a constitutional law. It means that there is a legal separation between people based on their ethnic religious identity and a hierarchy where one group is privileged and the other group is lesser and discriminated against. Just to finish with a few uh, quotes regarding this, uh, regarding this new law. 
So the new law should protect the Jewish character of the state, even if it means sacrificing human rights. This was said by our former minister of justice, ironically, that in order to keep one group of people in a higher position, it is worth sacrificing human rights. Israel is not the state of all its citizens. According to the new law that we passed, Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and only it. This is by the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And then the last point, which I think is very powerful for us to discuss today, is that the, the inclusion of the general principle of equality is the exact opposite of what I want. This is the architect of the law that was passed. So just to finish very quickly, we are facing many different issues uh, when it comes to peace between Israelis and Palestinians. But the major one here is this. We are seeing the segregation and the degradation of Palestinian rights in order to support and empower one identity over the other. And for all of you who have experienced similar things throughout your history and have a real concern both for the security and safety for the Israeli Jewish people and for justice for the Palestinian people should be trying to keep notes of these issues because these two things that are going on, both the law and the annexation, could change completely the possibility of peace in our land and create an environment that could bring violence. Thank you. Jack Manaya, thank you very much indeed. He's the local program coordinator of the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel for the World Council of Churches. We're going to move along as quickly as we can. Uh, Father Dr. Jamal Carter is a parish priest in Ramallah and director of the Latin Patriarchate Schools in Palestine. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'm glad to join you with our friends in South Africa. Uh, I'm a parish priest, so I'm going to talk about uh, the daily life of uh, Palestinians and what it means, what the, does the annexation uh, mean to uh, the, the Palestinians on their um, daily life. First of all, um, the occupation, the military occupation of uh, the Palestinian territories began in 1967, 53 years ago, which means all my life. I lived all my life under occupation. And uh, we always uh, looked for a, uh, an end to occupation and uh, our freedom. Now, uh, when we look at the daily life and especially the economy, uh, when we see the control of Israel of all the territories, uh, we know that uh, Israel controls the economy as well. So we cannot expand, we cannot export, we don't have borders. Um, uh, so the measures taken by, by Israel suffocates our, our economy. If we talk about the right of movement to go from one place to another, the simple fact to go uh, within the West Bank, I cross several checkpoints and I need the permission of uh, the soldiers to go to see my family. Um, I am um, a canon of the Holy Sepulchre and I don't have the right to go to Jerusalem. I need a special permission from the Israeli military authorities uh, to go there. Uh, when I say permission uh, in South Africa, it's called pass. Uh, now, I have my pass, and it uh, says, uh, you know, the dates, where I can be, uh, the hours, etc. So we still live, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate, by the way, as, as a priest to have uh, this pass, to be able to go to Jerusalem. Uh, and if I want to organize any kind of pilgrimage uh, for our parishioners to go to Jerusalem, which is 20 kilometers from Ramallah, by the way, uh, it's a very complicated process. Uh, to, to go to visit the Holy Sepulchre and the Holy Places uh, here. So um, it's even more complicated for young people uh, in our schools uh, to do the, the, the same. We were not able to take them to, to Jerusalem uh, to see the Holy Places. So uh, we talk about every single aspect of our lives. Yesterday a parishioner came and he just asked me to uh, do the possible to, for him to obtain a pass for his mother to go to see a doctor inside Israel. And I called uh, our church and uh, we promised we'll do our best uh, just for him to go and to see uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the doctor. She's uh, an old lady. Uh, so those are um, another friend from Bejala lost uh, almost three quarters of his land because uh, Israel is uh, expanding the road linking uh, Gosh Etzion uh, settlements with Jerusalem. 
so people are losing their, their land and many lands are threatened, um, in, um, especially in Bethlehem area, but also in Ramallah area and other places. So uh, the country is uh, very small, by the way. Uh, so to lose land is uh, to lose uh, the income or li livelihood for, for the, the Palestinians. So uh, when we talk about uh, occupation, about annexation of this land, it touches all aspects of our daily life. Uh, and what's important I see is that people uh, lose hope uh, of having a just peace, creating an independent Palestinian state living in peace side by side with Israel. Uh, uh, and the, the question now is how can we have an independent uh, state when we have, uh, when they will annex the Jordan Valley? We will not have borders uh, or uh, the, the territories will be cut in small pieces uh, here and there. So all those questions are serious questions uh, and pushing people to uh, lose hope in a future of peace. And you know how dangerous it is for young people who may begin to think about leaving the country, looking for a better future in, in other places, or maybe other people commit disparate acts also. Uh, so all those things are very dangerous, not only for our present life, but also for the future. And as a pastor, and when I preach the word of God, and when I hear the use of the word of God, uh, that's a very important question because I'm talking about my daily contact with uh, the faithful. Um, we know from our history that many evils in the church were justified with the Bible. Uh, slavery was justified with the Bible. Apartheid was justified with the Bible. Um, you know, um, in the name of God, uh, you know, many people did wars uh, against others, etc. So I think that we should learn from history, and especially our brothers and sisters in South Africa, they know very well what it means uh, to use and abuse the word of God to justify um, you know, injustice. So in our case, if we talk about uh, occupation and uh, we say this is uh, the promised land that in the Bible God gave it to his uh, chosen people, etc., that's a very dangerous uh, use of um, and abuse of the word of God, justifying the oppression of the Palestinians. Uh, those who um, bless Israel or curse Israel will be cursed by God. I, the God that we know is a just, uh, loving God. We are all children of God and he loves us all. And we can never accept that the plan of God will include the suffering and the Nakba of the Palestinians. So when we hear those uh, interpretations um, of, the, of the Bible, it's a question of life and death for us. It's not an abstract science to interpret the word of God for us. It touches our lives. It hurts uh, when we see our brothers and sisters using the, the, the word of God. So let us keep the innocence uh, of, uh, of God and keep the word of God as good news, as source of life for everyone. Uh, we keep receiving you know, questions from our parishioners. Uh, we, need, <clears throat> we need to read uh, and to, to um, you know, study the, the, the word of God uh, as source of life, source of justice for everyone. So those are my introductory uh, comments about the daily life of our community, the dangers for the future of the Christian community and uh, the way of reading the word of God uh, to give life, not death. This is a living word, a, a word that gives life, never death. Thank you very much. Uh, Father Dr. Jamal Carter, thank you very much indeed, sir, uh, parish priest in Ramallah and director of the Latin Patriarch at Schools in Palestine. Uh, we'll move on. Sharona Weiss is the director of international relations at Yeshtin, an Israeli human rights organization. Uh, Sharona, I'll try and give you as, as much of the 10 minutes as you're allowed. Thank you. Go for it. I'll try to make it uh, faster than 10 minutes, but we'll see. Um, and thank you to Jack and to Father Jamal for the excellent, first of all, the excellent background from Jack and the um, personal stories from Father Jamal as a Palestinian living under occupation. Um, as was mentioned, I work at the Israeli Human Rights Organization, Yeshdin, 
And with annexation looming, we've seized the opportunity to advocate for an end, not only to annexation plans, but also to the already existing situation of occupation and apartheid. We also recognize our privilege and responsibility as an Israeli organization. Unfortunately, Europeans pay more attention to what we have to say than what Palestinians, who are actually personally suffering under occupation, might say. For instance, colleagues like Sayyid al Haq who have very similar analyses and ex extensive expertise um, to us. Um, on April 20th, the co a coalition agreement was signed to form the Israeli government, including a clause allowing for the potential annexation to proceed as early as July 1st, yesterday. Um, we scrambled to release a position paper on the potential impact it would have on Palestinians' human rights. I mean, what else are you going to do while closed in our houses under lockdown? <laughs> Um, for some history and background, I think Jack gave a lot of very, very good background, but uh, since the occupation's inception, Israel has rejected the position that these territories were occupied, even beginning with then Commander Abba Ibn, who laid down the position that has remained more or less the same, using the term disputed territories as a way to whitewash its responsibilities while still assuring the world that its activities and violations in occupied territory were merely temporary. As obviously as Jack showed with the maps, and as he mentioned, there are many reasons to believe that Israel never intended to put its control of the land or domination over the Palestinian people even from the start. However, in theory, this was the position. Netanyahu's government is really the first to completely retract from this position blatantly in several ways, including via measures and steps towards annexation. Now keep in mind that the prohibition on annexation of lands conquered by force is connected to principles of international law that were passed after World War II, prohibiting states from using force for exploitative aims by allowing um, exploitation of occupied territory and even more annexation. This would incentivize wars of aggression and exploitation, shaking the entire international order, rendering these international principles meaningless. So it's not only about Israelis and Palestinians, though also that, but it's also about all of us around the world. At Yeshdin, we began monitoring the situation of de facto or creeping annexation several years ago, with our first in-depth report on the matter being occupation to annexation in 2006, in which we examined the silent adoption of the recommendations given in the Levy Committee report. This committee was appointed in 2012 to advise the Netanyahu government on um, what to do with the so-called unauthorized outposts in the West Bank. This government-sponsored committee released a report essentially stating that the laws of belligerent occupation and the Fulton Convention are not applicable, and set forth a number of ways for retroactively authorizing most illegal Jewish construction in the West Bank. Note that no such mechanism was given for authorizing it. Palestinian construction, despite that Palestinians have almost no chance of receiving legal building permits from the Israeli regime. Our report revealed that in the years after, the government was silently implementing many of these measures while telling the world at the same time that it was still striving for a two-state solution and that its activities were temporary. However, in the years following our report, the government ceased even claiming its efforts were temporary. In 2017, the regularization or expropriation bill passed, allowing for the retroactive authorization of nearly all um, unauthorized Israeli construction and the expropriation of significant amounts of Palestinian land. The High Court just dismissed this bill last month, likely knowing that annexation will soon proceed or that other measures are possible. The government also began speaking of annexation much more openly with US support. During Israel's 20th Knesset, 60 measures were introduced, eight of which passed, indicating some application of Israeli sovereignty in the West Bank. So now we've arrived to this point where we have full-blown annexation potentially happening in the coming days or months. Yeshdin has identified several actual ways that annexation could harm Palestinians' human rights, not only for those living within annexed territory, which is likely to be very few based on the maps that have been presented, but also to those living in other areas of the West Bank. First of all, annexation would entail a significant violation of Palestinians' property rights and the ability to, de to develop. The Israel Declaration of Sovereignty would expect significant amounts of land expropriated for settlement expansion and for construction of roads. A likely way to do this would be to use the Absentee Properties Law of 1950, 
which was used to transfer Palestinian land and property to Israel following the 1948 war, and which is still being applied in occupied East Jerusalem, leading to, to evictions there to this day. The law stipulates that property owned by a citizen or resident of a quote-unquote enemy state or a person in mandatory Palestine but not who is absent, such as living overseas, could be immediately transferred to the custodian of absentee's property in the civil administration. Since most land owned in Area C belongs to Palestinians who live actually in Area B, sometimes also Area A, this could lead to the expropriation of potentially hundreds of thousands of dunams of Palestinian land, significantly harming sources of income gleaned from agriculture. Even if this land is not all expropriated, Palestinians living in areas B or A would have to gain permits to access their own land in area C or in annexed territory, or something akin to a visa. This is already the case for many Palestinians who own land adjacent Israeli settlement jurisdictions. These permits are arbitrarily given and taken at will for a mere few days a year. And during those few days, Palestinians often encounter significant violence at the hands of Israeli settlers. We would expect this to be the case with many more dunams of land should annexation proceed, preventing Palestinians from gleaning their livelihood and from enjoying their own natural resources. In addition, settlement expansion would impede development. Palestinian communities, even in areas A and B, are surrounded or bordered by areas C and areas facing potential annexation, which means that annexation would restrict and impede their expansion or any development of these communities. In addition, any communities within annexed territory, which would be very few, would probably not receive priority for planning, as is already the case even under the current military regime. Annexation would also have significant impacts on Palestinians' freedom of movement. We would expect increases in road blockages, lack of access to roads, which construction would advance to connect Israeli settlements, while Palestinians would be denied access to many main arteries. Entry into annexed territory including roads, would be governed by the entry into Israel law, forcing Palestinians to either obtain a permit from Israel or go around the annexed territory, often taking significant detours. In addition, certain plans, including Trump's proposed plan, would include the Jordan Valley, and annexation would make it much more difficult for Palestinians to travel overseas and to leave the occupied territory at all, as they would pass through annexed areas to travel to, um, to Jordan, and that would require special permits. In addition, we anticipate a heightened threat of demolitions and expulsions of communities not recognized by Israel, such as herding communities. Um, maybe some of you have heard of Khan al um, Also, there are many communities in the South Hebron Hills in which Israel will not, will not um, actually recognize the communities and list the residents in nearby Yatta. Um, many of these communities we would expect would be forced out. We also expect even further control over natural resources, as the areas to be annexed are the most rich in natural resources, and Israel would be expected to further exploit most notably water, leaving Palestinians with even, fewer, even less access than they already have. Lastly, on the status of Palestinians within annexed areas, which we don't expect to be very many, we can guess that those who remain, it would be similar to East Jerusalem where the vast majority of those who apply have their applications rejected. In, a, in addition, Netanyahu and other leaders have suggested that there will be no Palestinian annexed areas. Likely they'll be forced into Palestinian enclaves, but that if there are, no citizenship will be given to them. To some, I'll, I don't want to make comparisons with the regime that many of you suffered under in South Africa, as I don't think we can claim that each detail is the same, and many of you would have much more to say on the matter. But I will say that we have a situation already, even before annexation, in which Palestinians are being forced into less and less space, less access to resources, and no um, rights being afforded them, while Israelis are enjoying sprawling spaces, sprawling access to um, Palestinian resources, and full political and human rights. And even, and even if annexation should not proceed, we have a responsibility to do all we can to end the long-term belligerent occupation and crime of apartheid being committed against the Palestinian people and to strive for a future of freedom and equality for Palestinians and Israelis alike. Thank you.
Rona Vies, thank you very much indeed, Director of International Relations at Dieshtin. It's an Israeli human rights organization. All right, we are, of course, going to take questions on the chat. You know how it works. You chat in the questions. Now, we've got some coming in already, and we will go through them for the panelists, and I'll sort of moderate that as we go. But first, we have our, our well, our final speaker, not our least speaker, just our final speaker, chronologically speaking, Dr. Uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Munta Isaac is a parish priest at the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem in Palestine and the academic dean at the Bethlehem Bible College. Uh, uh, Father Isaac, uh, you have your uh, 10 minutes. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stephen and all, and uh, it's uh, uh, my joy and privilege to be with you. And um, I would like first to thank all the panelists for uh, their important presentations. Uh, and if, if anything, I want to say is that really the occupation impacts every aspect of our lives as Palestinians. And now the annexation will make it even worse. And as a pastor, uh, dealing with these issues is the norm. You know, we have family, uh, family in our church uh, whose land is under threat uh, of confiscation. Uh, we have families who uh, are struggling with their residency rights in Jerusalem. Uh, we have a family who had to simply leave the country because Israel would not grant the spouse the visa uh, to live uh, in the land. So issues of discrimination are issues we face, uh, let alone the checkpoints we have to pass on a daily basis and the humiliation we go through on these uh, checkpoints. Uh, but when you look at our history as Palestinians, and this is what I would like to take, you know, uh, devote my five minutes on is, is how the Bible has been used in all of this, uh, all of this injustice. Uh, and, and it's no exaggeration to say that for us Palestinians, this is kind of the double, uh, the, 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 the catastrophe or, or Nakba as we call it in Arabic. The idea that as if it's not enough that we had to go through all of this injustice, uh, it has been done in the name of the Bible and the God of the Bible. And I'm not simply here calling out the Zionist movement. I'm talking about Christians who support the injustices that go through us in the name of the Bible. Uh, Christians who look at the land and only see uh, one side. They look at it as a Jewish land, as if there are no Palestinians living in it. Uh, so they see an empty land, uh, or even they see a land, and then we as Palestinians are the, the wrong side, the bad side, the uh, that's why we are often dehumanized and called out as terrorists and so on because we're the enemies and they don't see us uh, uh, They don't see our, our existence simply using languages the land belongs to the Jewish people as an eternal possession for example, and we simply say What about us? We've been living here for hundreds if not thousands of years. What is the proposition here? Uh, is it that we leave the country? Uh, is it that we accept to live as second-class citizens? And, and so it would not do to simply use these theological phrases and say, yeah, Jews have the right to the land without answering the question of the Palestinians who've been living here for all of these years. Uh, and as a theologian myself, I had to wrestle with this question. Does the Bible really teach that? Does the Bible teach a message of discrimination that God privileges one people over the other? Uh, and, you know, when you read the Bible, you don't see that. I mean, even the, the messages that, or the verses that are often quoted by Christians who support Israel, for example, the Abrahamic promise and the Abrahamic blessing. Uh, Genesis 12, the Abrahamic promise is a promise of blessing through Abraham and his offspring to all the nations of the world. Uh, it's, a, it's a very universal and inclusive uh, promise. The whole idea, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, if you read the Bible, it leads us to God's desire to bless all the nations, and ultimately that was uh, fulfilled in Christ, and has nothing to do with how Christians should shape their foreign policies 4,000 years later. God is desirous to bless all people, not to single out one people over against everyone uh, else. And so we need to read the Bible holistically with, with, open, with open eyes. I mean, if you really focus uh, or read carefully the Bible, it's all about justice. God cares so much about justice. Uh, it's integral to the call to Abraham and to, to the people of Israel, the Israelites in the Hebrew scripture. God cares so much. In, in fact, justice is a condition to being able to benefit from the land. In fact, I would even say, and, and I've written a lot about this, the gift of the land was, uh, the purpose behind the gift of the land is to uh, guarantee that everyone is cared for, to create 
an ideal situation in which justice rules, in which uh, there is no one oppressed, no one left out, not even the stranger, not even uh, the widows, the, the poor, everyone's to be cared for. It's part of the covenant and the land is part of that deal. It's not simply you have the land as an eternal possession. Everything belongs to God uh, ultimately. And it's important then to say, to see how this message of not just inclusivity, but e equality is again inherent and integral to the Christian gospel. Paul makes it so clear in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, free or slave, male or female, but we are all one. Uh, and, and Paul was speaking to uh, Christians who wanted to kind of create two categories within the body of Christ. And he was saying, no, 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 you cannot do that. There is no privilege for one over the other. We're all one, uh, uh, one in Christ. And so how do we continue to ignore these messages? Or how do some Christians continue to ignore these clear biblical teachings that in Christ we should all be uh, one? Uh, the whole message of the kingdom of righteousness uh, and truth. How do we con can we continue to ignore uh, those messages? Uh, the gospel, the good news is that God loves all of us. And this is our call as Christians uh, to be peacemakers. I am so troubled. I'm so troubled, not just as a Palestinian, but as a pastor, when the Bible is weaponized against one people. It's so troubling. The Bible that's supposed to contain the good news uh, of, of God's love to all people. Uh, and, and how not only it's weaponized against us, it's used to manipulate. You know, when I hear people say, if you bless Israel, God will bless you. Again, the message here is that you have to bless Israel so that you avoid the curse of God. It's not like really about the love for uh, the Jewish people or the love for peace. No, it's manipulation when you say these things. I mean, how are we, do we continue to allow the Bible to be used in such a way? No, the God I, I encountered in the Bible, the God we encountered in Jesus, the son of our town who was born literally one, two minutes walking from here, uh, is a God of righteousness, of love, of justice. A God who uh, the incarnation tells us he is with us, he abides uh, uh, with us. And so again, I am so troubled when the Bible is used in such a way. And to be honest, I'm more troubled when Christians from the majority world or the global South use the Bible in such a way. It's one thing for a Western Christian with their history of colonization to use the Bible in this way, but it's a totally another thing uh, when people from the global South. I want to end with a quote uh, by a dear friend. Uh, and he says this, we have been dispossessed of our land. We have been dehumanized discriminated against and exploited by people who claim to be Christians. And maybe in our case, in, supported by people who claim to be Christians. And I continue the quote now. To deepen our dilemma, those Western countries, which mostly lay claim to a Western traditional heritage, support the South African regime and reinforce its capacity to retain white power. Uh, these words by, were written by Frank Chicano, who I believe is with us here, uh, during apartheid. And it's shocking to me, mind-boggling, to see the same things repeated again. Christians supporting discrimination, even apartheid, in the name of the Bible. Uh, and I'm so happy that to see, you know, others speaking. I'm grateful for Brother Frank's uh, uh, words, and they apply so true even to our context. Uh, today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Munda Isaac, uh, Father Isaac, thank you very much indeed. I really do appreciate the presentation. Right, we're going to start moving to uh, some of the questions now. You can use the chat. There is the Q&A function as well. I'll sort of look through them as we go. Really, I must say, lots of comments. Uh, it is a, a contentious issue with the long history, so lots of um, polite disagreement, which I think is what we would expect. Um, I do want to start, uh, Sharon, with a question to you. Several people have made this point, and it has been made even before we started the webinar, which is, is this all just about Israeli politics? And the question really goes to this, 
is it really going to happen? Or is Netanyahu, or is uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, just, did he just do it for the election? And there's a corollary here, I don't know how, how aware you'll be of the arguments that in South Africa we have around land, where, where, where most white people own most of the land and very few black people have any land at all because of our history. And, and the question comes that this has been used many times in South African politics to get votes and then it falls away, the question falls away. Is the same thing going to happen here? It doesn't seem like it, even though we haven't had the annexation happen yet. Um, to, be, to be honest, I can't answer 100%. Um, but one thing that, according to our, what we see in Israeli politics and what we also know from experience, there's two things. One, it's already been happening. So the government, especially as I said, since 2017, has already been taking uh, measures and taking steps towards de facto and even de jure annexation on the ground and begin, beginning to apply Israeli sovereignty, even though there hasn't been any major announcement. Um, so this is one. Now, as far as annexing whole, for instance, settlement blocks or whole parts of the West Bank, um, it's hard to know, but we do see that probably the Israeli government wants to seize this opportunity. They only have the guarantee of having a very, very supportive um, government in the U.S. up until November, and then there's no guarantee that Trump will be reelected. Um, now, I will say I don't have much confidence in Biden. I think Biden, anything that does happen before November, Biden is not likely to reverse. So I do know that, but that gives the Israeli government all the more um, impetus to try to take action between now and November. Now, when that'll happen and how it'll happen is a big question because we, it's obviously, it doesn't seem like it's happening this week. And it may be that the government takes small steps in the coming months, but I think they want to take steps because they, they have basically until November or maybe at most January um, to, to truly take, um, to make decisions that can't, let, aren't likely to be reversed. So in short, that's, that's what I would predict. It's, it's politics and therefore in a way difficult to predict and all sorts of things can happen. Sharona, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jack, I would like to ask you a question. It sort of has come through in the chat in different ways from different people. So let me try and sort of put it together. And I'm sure it's an argument that, that you've dealt with in the past. The issue around identity, and I thought your, your quotes at the end of your, of your powerful presentation, the quotes were particularly powerful. Israel says that, to sum it up, and I'm oversimplifying now, Israel says that Jewish people would have more rights than Palestinians, that is explicit a, a Jewish state. And, and you will know the argument that can come sort of against the Palestinian people in a way, and again I'm going to put this very crudely, that Palestinian people won't allow Jewish people to live in their areas. In a way the argument really is that, and I think the argument is used by people who justify some Israeli policies, that Israel can treat Palestinians like this because Palestinians would treat Jewish people in the same way if things were reversed. I'm sure you've come across this argument before. How would you respond to it? Well, first of all, it, Israeli Jews are already living in Palestinian territory. So there's no need to look at a hypothetical. It's something that's already happening. And so um, th this is a situation which already exists and it, is, and it is going on. Second of all, whether you take them seriously or not, the PLO has announced that they would give full Palestinian citizenship to any Israeli that would end up on the Palestinian side of a future peace agreement. Uh, but to be honest, uh, these types of questions, I think, um, don't help us move forward. Our, 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 um, our goal is to have peace both for Israelis and for Palestinians. And I think uh, uh, people like Sharona, myself, uh, Munder, uh, Father Jamal have all engaged with people from the other side who want to have peace and can live together. Uh, there are uh, peace builders and peace uh, activists uh, who are already implementing um, joint lives together. So I don't really buy these arguments of hypothetical. The second aspect is um, the what if argument, I don't think is a very good one. Uh, th this is the reality of the situation that we're in. And we cannot make decisions based on what if and what if. And if we want to hold ourselves to this, the standard of the worst, the worst level, 
then then that's not a very high standard. In other words, what I mean is, if we say, well, if they did this, if they're going to do this to us, then we might as well do it first. I don't think that that's a very uh, that's a very human rights based approach. I don't think that it's uh, a good one for equality and a good one for justice. Uh, and especially as Christians, if we want to tr love our neighbor as ourselves, we must treat people the way we want to be treated. We don't treat people based on how we assume they're going to treat us. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, uh, Father Dr. Isaac, if I can, if I can just ask a question around you, you spoke quite powerfully about the Bible being weaponized, I think was the phrase that you used. Um, and we, we've seen this entering politics in many countries. I mean, there's a long history here. It does seem that this is happening more, more and more often. And it would, it would strike me, and I'm not someone who would call myself a religious man, and I'm not studied in these things, but it would strike me that what you're likely to see is two different groups of people, and you have this, I think, in the Middle East, and you have it in South Africa to an extent. You have two different groups of people who believe in two separate facts, two separate sets of facts. And this has happened in the United States, largely, even around things like COVID-19. Um, what does this mean then for almost all of Christianity, if we have different groups of people who profess to be Christians, and I think we must accept that they are, and yet they believe completely different sets of facts and different versions of the Bible when it comes to the Holy Land. What does that mean? Well, that means that we have to, uh, first of all, listen to one another. And oftentimes, you know, uh, people who, you know, again, just weaponize the Bible, what we tell them is, come to our land, sit with us, and discuss the, the realities on the ground, uh, and then let's read the Bible. See, see with your aunt, the, the, and I think this will change the whole uh, uh, discussion. It's so much comfortable for someone sitting at the comfort of their office somewhere in, in the United States or Canada or South Africa and interpret the Bible devoid from facts on the ground or from how that interpretation impacts uh, 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 the lives uh, on the ground. So I would say, come and let's have uh, a discussion. And I would second say, regardless of, you know, here's how I would put it. If my theology or my interpretation, Stephen, produces a version of discrimination or produces uh, uh, injustice or a vision in which God favors one nation over the other, I think there's something profoundly wrong with that theology. Uh, I think, you know, we, we say, we use two fancy words in, uh, as theologians. We say the true test of orthodoxy, the right theology, is orthopraxy, the right practice. So if my theology does not lead me to love my neighbor as myself, uh, if, if it does not lead me to include people and seek an ideal situation of justice, even with those with whom I disagree uh, uh, on faith issues, whether, you know, uh, different uh, faiths, different religion, or atheists, if, if my theology does not lead me to love them, to seek to live in peace with them, if my theology does not see, lead me to, to see God's image in every human being, there's something profoundly wrong uh, with that uh, theology. And so that is how I, I would say we should, you know, when we discuss and disagree uh, with one another, sometimes, yes, there is room for disagreement among us, even Christians. Uh, but when that disagreement seeks to eliminate a whole people, let alone, you know, your sisters and brothers, there's something profoundly wrong with that uh, theology. Thank you. Um, if I could ask, uh, uh, we've got some questions coming through on the chat now, and I'd like to sort of go to them as well. If I could ask you, um, uh, Father Dr. Carter um, from Ramallah, and you spoke very powerfully about the limitations placed on your freedom of movement. Uh, I think the example you used of, of someone who needed a pass for their mother to go and seek medical treatment, um, you know, is a very powerful one. Cheryl has asked on, on the chat, she says, please explain the similarities of apartheid practices that are enforced in Israel today. I've been to Israel, I haven't seen separation. Current uh, Judea and Samaria are controlled by the PA, the Palestinian Authority, and Gaza are controlled by Hamas, who do not have peaceful intentions towards the only Jewish state. That's the question that she's put through. I think uh, many people are using this old cliche uh, and repeating it, uh, and those are um, only cliches. Uh, we are talking about uh, the violence of the Palestinians. We condemn any violence. 
but why don't we talk about violence against the Palestinians? Someone reminded us of uh, two Israelis killed in 2002. What about the Palestinians killed this week and continue to be uh, killed? It's, um, it's a wrong path to compete uh, for uh, victimology, meaning that, you know, who's more victim than the other? How can we work just to have a just uh, situation. In, in our case, as I am um, a Palestinian from the Palestinian territories with this color of my ID, uh, I have less rights. I don't have the right as a Palestinian to build uh, a house, a factory, anything in si more than 60% of my land uh, because it's Area C under Israeli control. Um, the Palestinian Authority uh, is there to um, regulate the civil life, but they don't have authority on the land. The Israeli uh, soldiers come every day to Area A, even. And um, let me tell you, and uh, I ask your prayers for uh, Rami and Hanin Fadail. Uh, Rami is in prison for the last two years without accusation, without trial, uh, without anything. This is administrative detention which is unjust. He doesn't know why he is in prison. And yesterday morning at 3 a.m., the Israeli soldiers came in big numbers to arrest his young wife. And they left their daughter of 10 uh, years old alone at home, and she was attacked by the soldiers. And she doesn't know. Uh, there are no accusations uh, against, against her. So it's a daily thing, daily suffering. Uh, uh, you know, the right of movement, the uh, right of developing our economy, uh, right of um, uh, family unification. Um, there are many rights that we are denied uh, and in many places that we, we cannot live. Even for Palestinians living inside Israel, there are areas where they cannot live. So just because I'm a Palestinian, uh, I, I, um, I don't have those basic rights. And for the many Palestinians killed by the Israeli soldiers. The story is already, you know, it's, it's a set and everyone believes that story, but we know of uh, many who were killed unjustly. Um, so I have the right to my dignity. I have the right to my life, to control my destiny, to be free in, in my own country. Uh, those, all those rights are denied and they affect my daily life and the daily life of all the Palestinians, including the, the Christians. So uh, what we uh, talk about, what we work for, and I can speak of the people who are uh, with us, uh, Dr. Munder, uh, Jack, uh, uh, Sharon, etc., is a situation where everyone is equal. I cannot, uh, as a Palestinian, be treated less. I'm not the child of a lesser God. Uh, Palestinian lives matter. You cannot, you know, uh, do whatever you want with them because they are just Palestinians. That's not Jewish blood. We need to respect the Jewish blood and the Palestinian blood as well. So what we are working for is a situation where we all enjoy the same rights and we, where we all can live uh, together uh, justly in, in the same uh, country, uh, to keep continue to talk about Hamas, etc. Uh, you know, Hamas is talking more, more than acting, and I'm totally opposed to the ideology of Hamas. That's very clear for me. Uh, but they have a point in the sense that, uh, you know, they want to defend uh, their, their, their country, and they have the right to do so. Uh, is it an, a terroristic organization that Israel wants to... Uh, make it that way. That's not everything about Hamas. I'm not defending, and I cannot defend Hamas, okay? That's, uh, that's for sure. But to blame the victims for, for being uh, victims, uh, that's unjust towards the Palestinians. We don't want to reverse it. We don't want anyone to be a victim. We don't want peace and justice on the expense of anyone. We want everyone to enjoy the same rights and to control their own lives. That's what we are working for. That's what we keep us, keeps us going. And for me, working in schools, that's a very important uh, issue because I'm dealing with young people. 
uh, I'm, you know, teaching them values of peace, justice, non-violence, uh, uh, peaceful coexistence, all those uh, values that are very important for us. That's not uh, an easy thing to do, but we want to continue because we want a better future for our children. Thank you very much. Father, thank you very much indeed. Um, there's been some interesting questions sort of about the past. And, and um, uh, Jack Manai, I'd like to put this to you because you brought maps and you showed us what had happened in history. I thought that was, that was very important. Although I think there's a much bigger conversation around history in the present, but we, we can get to that. And Sakho Shivambu has asked and put it like this, said, it's unfair to compare apartheid South Africa and Israel. The Jews are fighting for the restoration of their land. Uh, Jack, how do you respond to that? Um, thank you. Um, of course, apartheid South Africa and the situation that Palestinians are facing today is not identical. No two situations in the world are, but we must learn from each other's history, from human nature, in order to avoid injustices like apartheid from happening again. And here we do see some similarities. We see the segregation of people based on their ethnic religious background. We see people that should be sharing the same resource but one resource is given to one people more so than the other. Just take the example of water. Palestinians in the West Bank and settlers share the same resource of water, yet settlers receive six times more water than the Palestinians, even though they are using the same water source. This is an example for me, which I could learn from when I look at the apartheid situation historically in South Africa. When we see the state violence that suppresses people when they try and fight for their rights, this is again a situation which is similar to apartheid South Africa. When we have laws that raise one group of people over another based on the identity that they were born into, this is similar to the apartheid situation. Furthermore, it is South Africans themselves many times uh, that have come here and said, this looks familiar to us. You are facing many challenges that we face uh, back you know, back under apartheid regime. And so this is just a number of things that we can point to that indicate that in fact, there is similarities between the apartheid on both sides. Second of all, to say that Israel is just uh, retaking their land. Let's take hypothetically the premise that this is their land and that they are taking it over for them. That doesn't mean that, you, that apartheid cannot exist in that situation. You could be freeing your land and create and committing the crime against uh, humanity, which is apartheid. And so in this situation, we see two peoples living in the same area of land, the same resources, but one group controls the other. One group is able to limit the rights of another for their own identity benefit. And for this reason, we say there are similarities that we can point out when it comes to apartheid South Africa. Sorry, there we are. It's an, it's an important response. I would like to talk, and we, 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 you know, we're focusing specifically on the role to an extent of Christianity in this. Uh, and I'd like to, to start, uh, and I'd like to put it to both, to both uh, uh, priests on the panel. I'd like to start with you, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Um, Carter. The role of Christianity, the role of Christian people, of, of people of faith in resolving this, and I realize, I realize it's very complex and it goes to the very, very foundation of, of faiths in some ways. For you, living in, in Palestine where you live or in South Africa, as a Christian, what role should one play in resolving this? How would you do that? And I will ask the same of yourself, Dr. Hart. Oh, I, uh, I need to begin uh, by saying that uh, the church did, and uh, the churches in general, did a lot for... Uh, those who suffer, and in uh, this case, in our case, for the Palestinians and Palestinian refugees. Uh, I am a Catholic. I can talk about the Pontifical Mission for Palestine, about Caritas Jerusalem, about the institutions of uh, the Latin Patriarchate. Um, imagine that we have, um, you know, more than 115 Catholic schools in Palestine. And, uh, and we have a lot of friends and not only Catholic schools, by the way, and I'm talking about what I know as, as a Catholic, but I know very well that other churches are working uh, very close with, with people. And I know that we have a lot of friends all over the world who support us, support our mission, the mission of the, the church 
in uh, the, the daily needs uh, for, for the church. What I expect from Christians uh, actually are two things. One of them is the bright reading of the Bible. It really hurts when I hear a fellow brother and sister, a Christian, who tells me that you, were, you are expelled from this land because that's the plan of God. Uh, the God's plan uh, is being fulfilled with your catastrophe. It hurts. Uh, let us go back to the basics of our faith, of our, uh, when we see God as a uh, just loving God for everyone, Jew, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, non-atheist, etc. He's, he's God of everyone. I, I expect to uh, see the, the gospel as the gospel of mercy, uh, not as a weapon that we are using. The second thing is to have a, an influence in their respective countries on uh, political decisions. Because we have friends in the uh, civil society, uh, but uh, when it comes to governments, it's more about the interests of the government or what about the elections and you know many other things. How to influence uh, the uh, politics of our respective countries with our own values when we uh, seek justice for, for everyone, when we can influence um, those that we are electing in, in uh, uh, you know, our, um, our countries in order to work for justice. And believe me uh, that uh, the, um, the conflict and the suffering of the Palestinians has a lot, of, have a lot of negative consequences on the relations between countries in the Middle East and uh, beyond. And if, uh, and if and when a peace begins in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land, it will have a very positive impact on the whole region and in, in, in the you know, peace uh, all over the world. It should begin here. We can give an example that, yes, we can live with our own differences, uh, but that's what we need to work on all together everyone in his own or her own country uh, to work for a just peace uh, in, in Palestine, Israel. Can't hear you. We can't hear you. There we are. That'll be why. <laughs> my fault, sorry. Um, naughty finger. Um, my, question, my question to you is, is uh, what, what for you is the Christian response to this? How do we actually, how, how should, what should a Christian person uh, of, of, of any type of, of faith a Christian do to help resolve this? What is a Christian's duty, if you like, in this case? Well, uh, and I, I agree with the, what Father Jamal said, and uh, not to repeat, I would just say, you know, as Christians, around the world have the responsibility of when it comes to this conflict. Not only is this the land where the Bible, uh, where Christianity started and, and the biblical stories happened, uh, this is the first church, but on top of that, as I said, the Bible has been used. So we, we have to be, uh, take responsibility. Uh, and as I always say that it's time for the church to become part of the uh, uh, solution rather than part of the problem. I think it begins by caring. We should care for what's happening. We should have compassion and take the commandment of Jesus more seriously. The commandment, blessed are uh, the peacemakers. And peacemakers, I mean, when it comes to our context, the first thing we should say is, is learn what's happening. Come and see things on the ground. Uh, I continue to be troubled, Stephen and, and everyone, by the number of people around the world who make opinions about this conflict, yet without real knowledge on the ground, even disputing our own experience. You know, they want to tell us from their own place, no, no, you're wrong. I mean, come and we're living these things. So come and see things on the ground. Uh, and don't just do the, uh, you know, uh, touristic pilgrims thing where you spend the whole week in a hotel and enjoy the holy sites and think, yeah, I've been to the Holy Land. No, you haven't. You have to come and insight the other side of the wall, see the refugee camp, see land confiscation, uh, and so on. So as a peacemaker, you should listen to both sides of the story. You should educate yourself, but then it doesn't stop there. You should seek peace. You should uh, speak truth to power. You should, uh, as the Bible clearly tells us, defend the oppressed. And I always cite as Christians, sometimes we are mandated to take sides. When we see injustice happening, we have to cite 
with the, uh, uh, with the uh, oppressed. Uh, many times I see uh, well-intentioned Christians who come to our land and say, well, we pray for peace and, you know, we, we hope that you... That, that doesn't help, to be honest. The prayer, of course, is, is great, but you need to say what's wrong. You need to take sides sometimes. Uh, and finally, you know, I think after listening to both sides, after taking sides, I think it's important as Christians for us not to, to elevate every value of life, both the Palestinians and Israelis, and not to fall into the trap of dehumanizing and demonizing and stereotyping, which sadly I see many Christians doing uh, a lot of time. So let me recap, and I think this is important. For us, I believe the, the, the most important responsible Christian responsibility right now is to put an end to the occupation, to use all means we have as churches that honor God, of course. I'm not, you know, you know, nonviolence, creative resistance, to put an end to occupation. I think this should be the number one priority uh, of, of the church. And believe me, from there, once we hold these values of equality and that every life is equal before God, we can reach to the right political uh, solution. But as long as this uh, imbalance remains where there is an occupier and an occupied, we cannot move forward. I completely understand what you're saying, so thank you. Um, we are going to bring it to an end. I'm going to just invite uh, this, the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches, who I, I think is really our host, uh, Bishop Malusi Mpumwana, just to make a closing comment. Bishop, uh, there you are. Good to see you again. Um, uh, just, yes, the floor is yours, sir, if you'd like to say something to end. Thank you very much. I just want to take the moment, Stephen, first of all, to thank you for um, agreeing to moderate these conversations and to thank our panelists for taking the time uh, to educate us, especially because we hardly ever hear the voices of local Christians. And, um, and uh, thank you, thank you, Sharona, for giving us um, an, an alternative Israeli perspective. We did hear from uh, 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 you know, Rabbi Flesher on Sunday, and uh, clearly there are different views at, you know, at play here. I want to thank the participants for taking the time to be here with us, all those that have sent questions. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the questions, the probing questions, uh, especially also from the friend of Friends of Israel, uh, you know, participants that are in the group here, uh, because they, they actually enable the debate to be that much richer. I come away with two things that I would like to say in the end. The first one is that, uh, I think I say this often, but it's a very important thing for me. I, I studied theology and follow, after I had accepted the faith in Christ and said to myself, what does it mean to be created in the image of God if you are black in apartheid South Africa? And I struggled with this because the image of God was always of a white God. And I then discovered upon study that actually God is love. God is creator. God is just and righteous. God is free, nothing compels God. And God is holy, and holiness in Leviticus is given as honoring other people, honoring your parents, honoring and never putting a stumbling block in front of the blind person, and so on. And never withholding the, 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 the wages of, of a worker overnight. And this is all about how you relate to other people. We call this in South Africa, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, how you relate to other people. I am because you are. Now, once I recognize that actually these are the attributes of God, I realize that this is what Paul means when he says there is neither group, the Jew nor Gentile, because we're all one before God. And it is out of this premise that uh, I really would like to appeal for every effort to be made for all the people of the Holy Land to find each other, Jews and Palestinians, because we might have the, the promise of, of 3,000 years ago, but the fact is that we don't we're not going to use that only in Israel and not use it in the United States where we can say the Navajo and the Apache where that was their land 3,000 years ago therefore all the white Americans must leave we can't do that we are we cannot say the South Africans who are white in South Africa must leave because 3,000 years ago they were not here so we have to operate on the basis of present realities and apply justice but peace and security for, the, for Israel and peace and security for Palestine is, in my view, non-negotiable. And I think that this conversation is enabling us 
to get a feel for where that might go. And thank you very much for giving us the time. It is the beginning of a conversation that we shall continue to have in our churches, in our communities, with hopefully a much more open mind. Thank you. Bishop, thank you very much indeed. Just a final thanks to our panelists. Uh, Jack Manaya is the local program coordinator of the Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel for the World Council of, Prov of uh, Churches. Uh, the Reverend Father D Dr. Jamal Carter is a parish priest in Ramallah. Thank you, sir. Director of the Latin Patriarch and Schools in Palestine. Sharona Weiss is the Director of International Relations at Yesh Din, an Israeli human rights organization. Thank you. And then uh, finally, Dr. Muntha Isaac is a parish priest at the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, Palestine, and the Academic Dean of the Bethlehem Bible, uh, Bible College. Thank you all very much indeed. I really do appreciate the time. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you.